Welcome to our first of the month guest speaker series in Central Region, our uh, people category. And I uh, just quote uh, Ken Graham uh, earlier, the first and what drives all the priorities is the well-being of our people in the weather service. So let's talk people. Uh, again, uh, the blueprint is something well underway in Central Region. I'll touch on that at the end of the call. But I want to jump right in to our DEIA programs. Uh, Jennifer Prieto, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Prieto. I'm the DEIA workgroup lead. And I'm sure you guys are well known, but um, February is Black History Month. So we are going to dive right in, just kind of talking about the history, um, some of the resources that you can take advantage of. And then we also have a special guest speaker that would want to speak on his career and his time at his office. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to highlight some artwork. Um, throughout the years because the theme of this year is African Americans and the arts. So you'll see some of these captions of uh, the different types of photos and paintings um, created by African Americans through the years. So originally the importance of Black History Month is obviously to honor achievements and celebrate the lives of African Americans who have made impacts on American society. Uh, this began um, in an interesting way, uh, not typical of what you see of official observances. Uh, a Harvard historian, his name was Carter G. Woodson, uh, back in 1915, he founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. He thought it was very important that they researched and promote achievements by Black Americans and other people of African descent. Um, and he preserved that information and shared it with other colleges across the nation. He uh, today is known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, uh, but they started a uh, organization or a National H Negro History Week back in 1926. And they chose the second week of February because it is the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, who were instrumental in uh, the promotion of ridding of slavery and promoting um, African American culture. So this event was inspired by schools and communities nationwide. They organized local celebrations, had history clubs and performances as well. Um, but as time went on, they realized that it needed to be longer than a week. So in the 1960s with the civil rights movement that was going on, they started annual proclamations within the college campuses that expanded that Negro History Week into an entire month. So it was more of like a, a movement in the 60s that um, were driven by the college campuses to promote those celebrations throughout the month of February. And um, in 1976, you had President Gerald Ford. He officially recognized uh, Black History Month and it has been recognized ever since then. So resources here, um, how can I uh, find support in the Weather Service or how can I become an ally? Um, there are some great resources within the Weather Service and in NOAA that you can look into, and I highly encourage you just to check them out, uh, starting with the African American Employee Resource Group. They are called The Village, and I will link uh, their website in the chat. They are welcoming allies, anyone that's interested in just reading more about what they do. They are a very active group, and they meet every month. Their core goals are retention and recruitment efforts within the community. They work on mentoring and coaching, networking, outreach, and professional development. Um, they also um, work on building up allies and, you know, finding out what that looks like. Um, ally is someone who utilizes that privilege and influence to amplify voices of underrepresented individuals. So, you know, anyone can be an ally and um, it might be an interesting opportunity for you or your office to get involved with. Another thing you could do is attend the NOAA SEPM program and events that they held e each month or throughout the month. There is an email forthcoming on that that'll have some different events that you could attend with you or your office. Uh, we also have an African-American uh, Special Emphasis Program Manager for Central Region. Uh, he's actually on the call, David Beachler, and he uh, would be happy to chat with you if you wanted to, to meet up with him and find out what's going on with the Diversity Management Council and other of uh, African-American SEPM uh, representatives across the Weather Service. And lastly, there is the Weather Service Buddy Program and Buddy System Connect. This is a great program that is just now kicking up, so it's 
probably not too late to look into and see if you would be interested in that, especially if you're in an office where uh, maybe you don't feel included as well, or maybe you don't um, feel like you want to reach out to others that have similar commonalities. Um, it could help build that bridge and connect you with with folks that um, you guys could create relationships and have those conversations. I highly recommend even if you're a seasoned employee or you're just starting out, you could look into that and see if that would work for you and kind of help build that belonging within the agency. Um, there, I'm sure there are others. I put that in the end just as an open-ended question. Uh, throughout the presentation today, if you think of other ideas and how you could be an ally or find support in the weather service, um, please feel free to drop that in the chat and we will we will save that uh, for, for later reference when we send this out to the group. Now I'd like to introduce our special guest speaker. His name is Michael Hill and he is the WCM at WFO Jackson. So Michael, if you're on, please go ahead. Hey everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Hill. I'm the National Weather Service WCM at uh, Jackson and I'm I'm on the road today. That's why I'm in an expedition. I have a call. I mean, I have a, a presentation to give here in about uh, 20 minutes at a health clinic in Meridian, Mississippi. So I'm on the road. Uh, I wish I could have stayed on longer because I can I can talk, but I'm not going to do a lot of talking uh, today. But uh, this is my journey to the National Weather Service as an African American male, um, and, and you know, trying to get into meteorology. I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, I grew up there um, in the Deep South. Uh, graduated from Mississippi State. Uh, I actually started in broadcast, broadcast meteorology. Uh, did some television work in Jackson on a little place called Weather Vision that was like an affiliate, you know, like not an affiliate, but like a, a place that kind of like AccuWeather did like a whole bunch of weather for different stations um, all over the, the country. And then I, I, I volunteered starting in Jackson, Mississippi, which is funny. I volunteered at Jackson, Mississippi while I was in school and um, got that opportunity. And then I started in the National Weather Service in 2009 at WF, WFO Caribou now. Uh, you want to talk about culture shock and being an African American from the Deep South, um, going to Caribou, Maine at 23 years old, uh, so 2,000 miles away from home. Uh, it was it was it was a difficult transition. Um, I didn't see anybody that looked like me for two years when I was up there. Um, and that was an interesting thing. Uh, but, I mean, I was going to make it happen because I'm just that type of person. Uh, everybody is not like that, however. Uh, I just want you guys to know that, um, you know, it can be very isolating as a person that's different from other people, whether you be a Hispanic, African American, and even women um, in some of these workforces. We, we're doing a good job with hiring more women in the weather service, but we're still still lacking in the other areas uh, of this National Weather Service. In fact, there's only out of thirteen out of the thirteen forty series, as of last year, there was only like forty three African American meteorologists in the entire weather service in thirteen forties. Um, think about that. Forty. Forty two, forty three, somewhere in there. Out of all the meteorologists in the National Weather Service, we can all fit in a classroom. There's only two African American WCMs. There's only two African Americans. <laughs> only two African American MICs. There's only two African American Sioux, I believe. So it is very um, sparse. So the positive thing, though, I have about is caribou, though, is. What I want you guys to think about too is they accepted me. They made me feel like I was part of the team. I belong there. Um, and there are things that I had to think about like 
where do I get my haircut? Things that you won't think about. Uh, things that I was used to that weren't available to me. And so as an office, once you start bringing people in, I want to really uh, implore you to um, embrace your people. Make sure they feel like they're a part of the team. Make sure that they uh, have the things that they need, the resources that they need. Um, and I encourage you to hire people of color and hire people of different uh, backgrounds, uh, especially in Central Region. I know that there's very few African Americans in Central Region uh, in, in the offices. And so in order to do that, we have to bring people in. And I just implore you guys to think about hiring people of color or people uh, of different backgrounds to diversify the weather service and diversify uh, our outreach efforts um, going forward. And I know Ken is really big on people and the end results, people in the weather service, and he's really big on people outside. That's how we get our message out to the people. So again, I started in, in Caribou in 2009. That was an interesting place for me, fun. I was embraced, um, and then I moved to New Orleans, where I did a lot of work in um, DEIA stuff down there, as far as going to New Orleans East in the Ninth Ward, uh, doing mentoring for high school students. Uh, it wasn't even necessarily about meteorology, it was about life. It was about um, showing them that there are different things to do. Um, I brought them out to the weather service. I've given tours. Uh, I helped them get their college applications together, help them um, interview skills, uh, things of that nature. Uh, it wasn't even about meteorology. It was just about um, making sure that they had positive influences and positive um, relationships with people that looked like them in different places that they might not have thought about uh, as far as becoming a meteorologist. Uh, so I did a lot of work with that. Uh, then I became a lead forecaster in Memphis. Uh, and again, I started doing, I, I kept doing that same thing, uh, mentoring high school students. Uh, in fact, I have one student that is, um, I'm mentoring. He's going to Mississippi State. I helped, you know, I took him to the symposium, um, introduced him to meteorology. He was really interested in meteorology and uh, he wanted to be a meteorologist. So I, I said, hey man, let's, Let's do it. So I, you know, personal time. I take him down to the uh, symposium in, in Mississippi State. Let him meet the professors. Let him start talking to students about meteorology. Let him start um, talking to you know professional meteorologists. You know, getting them exposed to these things. It's you know, it's just one one person at a time. So he is going to go to Mississippi State. Uh, I have a call with him sometime later this month and make sure he got his classes in order. And, it, 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 you know, it's, it's one of those things that I'm very proud of to say, hey, I'm really doing something uh, to, to do that. And so to be continued with that, I hope he, you know, he does everything he needs to do. And I'm going to watch him all the way through college. Um, I'm going to make sure that he gets in the right positions, make sure that he has all the things that he needs to be successful. And then in 2023, I became the WCM at Jackson, which is one of the uh, uh, most uh, vulnerable CWAs, in my opinion, in the country. Uh, we have a lot of racial inequity, um, a lot of socioeconomic inequity. Just the other day, I was in a joint meeting. Well, I'd met with WFO Memphis, WCM and them. And we're planning to do a big uh, event in the Delta, several events in the Mississippi Delta, trying to get town hall meetings to for underserved communities. And um, they visited an emergency manager from a county and he said, oh, this side of the county, we have a storm shelter that seats 500 people. On the other side of the county, the other side of the tracks, he said, they don't have anything and we really don't go over there for the most part. And that was kind of shocking because it's 2024 and we're still talking about black versus white. Um, the other side of county um, is mostly black and 
they don't have any resources. All the resources on one side of the county, the other the people on the other side of the county don't really go over there to help them that much. Um, and we have a long way to go in certain portions of our area to break down these barriers. And I asked the young lady, we went somewhere and she was, you know, talking about how she got her weather information. Because I asked her, how do you get your weather information? Because we just had an ice event down here. She said, well, it just so happened that my husband works on a farm and he, the owner of the farm had the information and told us, so they're getting information second and third hand. So how do we fix that, right? Um, so I have just been spending a lot of my time uh, trying to break these barriers and trying to encourage everybody to um, break the barriers and try to get out in the community and grow the com grow our um, profession, grow our message, grow our mission, uh, grow the service uh, because we are um, service for everybody, um, everyone. So we got to be a little bit uncomfortable it might be a little bit uncomfortable growing and getting out into different places, but you have to be uncomfortable to grow. Uh, so, um, and a lot of minorities and women have to be uncomfortable all the time to grow. That's how we got to where we are. Um, so I take pride in that. Um, I take pride in myself becoming a WCM uh, because I am part of black history. Um, that's what I see myself as, as part of black history. There's very, been a very few African-American um, WCMs, and hopefully one day I'll be in MIC, and there's only be a few of those as well. So if we go to the next slide, again, I just wanted to say uh, DEI initiatives are important and not just a fad. Um, no matter what anybody says, they're very important because I see it when I'm out in the community, where either I'm working with young African-American males, or I'm working with, uh, you know, Hispanic uh, people or the elderly or women or little girls, whoever. There's, there's something about what we do that everybody loves. Everybody loves the weather. And we should be able to leverage that to, to grow our profession, grow the weather service, and then to inform the people so they don't get um, scared or they don't have, that they're informed, right? So we have a lot of work to do in underserved communities. Uh, utilize the diversity of the skill sets in your office and relationships in your office. Um, again, you might not have an African-American or a Hispanic person, but somebody in your office might have a relationship with somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Or some people are better talking to people than others. Uh, some people are skilled in different things. So it takes a whole office to, to break down these barriers, okay? Um, there's a few things that have been going to be utilized going forward. Uh, I'm, I was a part of the Tiger Team Task Force. Um, and we we created a guide for under for serving the underserved communities uh that was great uh hopefully you guys will look into that um i want to i want to like implore you guys to get out in the community um and mentor or go into communities and places that you're a little bit uncomfortable with and that guide will start as a, a starting point for you to get there and to, to, to build some of these relationships. Um, the social vulnerability S, uh, the SVI tool um, built from um, your region, uh, uh, St. Louis, that's a very important tool for you guys to use and see where some of these vulnerabilities all lie in your community. So um, I'll be quiet and ask for any questions. I got like five minutes before I need to go in here, but please ask me some questions. If you got, if, if, if I don't get around to it, um, email me i i just want people to be involved email me uh this we have a um the deia recruitment team that has been stood up uh that's nationwide uh some of you guys may be on it if not be on lookout on it we've been doing stuff but uh please any questions um i don't even want to talk about myself that much i just want to talk about growing um 
on the weather service. Um, but um, any questions, please feel free. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I know you were busy and you were able to to fit us in. I really, I really appreciate you sharing your stories and your experiences and your advice. Um, so I think we do have one quick question from Taylor. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, I raised my hand on accident. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine, Taylor. Um, and yes, I will, uh, the guide for serving underserved communities, I'm going to share my uh, slides right after this, and um, I'll put it in the chat, and it'll have the links that you can click on um, yeah. that are in the presentation as well. Yeah, so any questions or any comments, please, now's the time. If you don't uh, have anything else, um, just throw it, uh, throw me an email. Um, I'm, I'm all, I'm always available for speaking engagements or talking or anything. Like Jennifer said, they kind of came to me a couple of days ago. I was like, hey, can you? I was like, sure. And then I was like, oh, I got something planned, but I can make it happen. So uh, I really it, appreciate it. And that's exactly what you said. I knew someone that knew someone that knew you. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's how it works. So. Yeah, so don't be afraid to to utilize your networks for people. Um, and I, like I said, I want to use the time that I had for you guys, not necessarily talk about myself, but talking about, you know, thinking about what we can do better as a weather service and expanding our footprint, expanding our message, our mission to include everybody. Um, you know, Black History Month is about all those things that people made sacrifices for, uh, people that had an, a, a vision for a better tomorrow. Um, and that's what black history is all about. Um, there was a lot of struggle. It was a lot of sacrifice. It was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, but we're better for it. Um, so in that light, with the weather service, we're going to have to struggle we're gonna have to sacrifice we're gonna have to figure it out in order for us to grow uh and for us to expand our message expand our profession expand the weather service the recruitment the uh the uh the message to to the unserved community so everybody can be protected and in the know about weather sir about the um, mission of the weather service and protect themselves against the weather. So that's essentially what we're doing. This is what we're here for. So um, with that, I'll be quiet. Go in here and do my talk. And again, if you guys have any more questions, uh, email me. Uh, otherwise, I got to go. Thank you again, Michael. See you guys. That was fantastic. Jennifer, anything else for the, this morning? I think we're good to go to move on. All right. I just want to mention that uh, in Central Region, we have been working with the Office of Education, particularly the Education Partnership Program with Minority Serving Institutions. Uh, also working with uh, Bill Parker, the MIC down at Jacksonville, who has a, a long-standing relationship with Jackson State University, a uh, historically uh, Black college and university. And uh, we're trying to figure out how we can create greater opportunity in Central Region. Uh, progress has not been great. A lot of talks with Pat Brown to try to see how we can improve it. But again, uh, we appreciate the perspective that, uh, that Michael brings. And uh, we're doing our best to try to figure out ways to be more inclusive, uh, more diverse in, in our region. I'll stop on that note and I will take a pause and turn it over to the culture team at this point. So, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, uh, for inviting Michael. That was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Stephen Rodriguez. Uh, I am the uh, Central Region Culture Team co lead. Uh, thanks, everybody, for getting on this webinar uh, that here this morning. Um, great to have you here. Uh, we'll just we'll, we'll continue on the great discussion there from Jennifer, Jennifer and the DEI, DEI group, DEIA group, excuse me. Uh, we have uh, Megan Varsi from the Detroit office and Taylor Patterson from the Milwaukee office here to speak to some of their culture work at their offices. offices. We're super excited to have them. 
uh, speak with us here today. Uh, just real quickly, Hobi, uh, before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to, to give you a quick update from the culture team. Uh, we're looking forward to this upcoming year, continuing the work of building that network of support across Central Region, um, you know, just connecting with the field and seeking ways to further assist everyone. Uh, it's just very important to the Central Region culture team. So, you know, on that note, we'll be ramping up meetings with everyone once again here in the next month or two. And we're just, you know, super excited to kind of just seek opportunities to further assist the field there. Um, additionally, uh, this past week, we were super excited uh, to introduce, or at least now have our Central Region Culture Focal Points Google Space. Uh, once again, that's just began here the net in the last week, uh, Monday. And just in the, in the last couple of days, uh, the team has just been super excited, super happy where this is already going. Uh, we're just really looking forward to, to interacting with everyone in this forum uh, where we can share ideas, best practices, and most importantly, once again, uh, support support one another there. So. On that note, I'll pass it over to Megan to start with. Megan, if you are ready, feel free to share your slides. All right, it sounds good. Let's see. All right, you see my slides? Okay, so yep. um, I am just gonna give kind of a brief update on both our culture team and also our underserved and vulnerable communities team that we have at NWS Detroit. Uh, so my name is Megan Varsi. I'm the culture team focal point at the Detroit office as well as a forecaster here. So starting off uh, with the organizational health blueprint at NWS Detroit, We've chosen kind of our two focus areas. Um, it was hard to choose because we have a lot of different initiatives that we're working on here, but we decided to go with the knowledge sharing and collaboration as kind of our number one priority. We're very science focused at our office. We have a lot of mesoscale uh, stuff that goes on with the lakes and, and things like that. So that's kind of number one. Um, and then our second kind of area that we're focusing on is transparency and openness. And I'll discuss some of our initiatives in the next few slides. So first, uh, knowledge sharing and collaboration, kind of an in progress thing that will be in progress um, as, as long as we do it is our local science blog. Um, so this started pretty much last summer uh, where we kind of started to look at a lot of our events that we've had, some of our busts, that we've had um, at our office. Of course, winter weather often busts, um, but we kind of try to do some local event reviews, uh, come up with some slideshows of um, figures and, and different kind of scientific aspects of events, where things went wrong, where things went right. And this kind of stemmed from, you know, we have a lot of local knowledge in our office and it's not always passed down um, as effectively to our younger forecasters. So this is just a way for us to really add some documentation um, on the science side of things to our office. So we try to do event reviews, but also expand that to blog posts about things going on around the country. Uh, we've been pretty busy though. So a lot of these, uh, these science posts have been focused on our own CWA. And then kind of coming out of our organizational health blueprint meeting that we had last June, we had some ideas of, of ways that we can expand knowledge sharing and collaboration outside of just the forecast side of things. Um, so this actually came from our ASAs and ETs at our office um, to provide some opportunities for our meteorologists to you know, go visit ASOS, co-ops, river gauges, because um, that's something, especially with COVID, that has kind of fallen off the bandwagon a bit. So um, we're trying to start that back up and, and get our forecasters out to see what our ETs do, what our hydrologist does and that sort of thing. And then kind of switching things up a little bit. Um, we also want to provide opportunities for our ETs and ASA to shadow us and see kind of what we do on a forecast shift so that it's not just, you know, them coming out and asking us what the forecast might be, but seeing a little bit into the process of how we do that. Um, so on the right here, these images are just kind of our basic template for our science sharing uh, Google slide or Google website. This is available to all of our forecasters. Um, so we also try to include some of the webinars that are going on across the region and across uh, the National Weather Service in general. 
and then also different program areas. So uh, this Google site is open for all of our forecasters to edit all of our focal points to just add, you know, some of the cool resources that they come across and not just, you know, keep it in their own their own bookmarks. So um, that's kind of the knowledge sharing and collaboration side of things. The next side is uh, transparency and openness, our second uh, focus area. So we already kind of do this at our office with some of our annual events that we have. Um, we typically do a holiday potluck as well as a summer office barbecue. Um, everybody in our office loves food. So um, it's a great way to you know, get everybody together and um, promote our, our culture team. Some of our in-progress initiatives, the first is our new employee welcome packet. So we do have a, a new WCM coming in. So hopefully this will be a good resource for her. She's kind of the guinea pig here. Um, but this is something that we're excited about. We kind of include beyond just our, our story map that's open to everybody. This is kind of more specific about uh, the NWS Detroit area, um, kind of, you know, local staff favorites, different places to go, things to see in the area. So hopefully it'll make um, any of our new employees comfortable coming to the area and having some things to do uh, right off the gate. So then our second initiative here is um, I've created a local culture Google page. So there's a lot of really good resources out there from a regional, national level, but um, I wanted to make things a little bit easier for our staff to just, you know, have a one-stop shop to, to see things like mental health resources, accessibility, all the employee resource groups that are out there. Um, just, you know, again, a, a really kind of a good, efficient way to see what's out there. So I know this is a little beyond just the culture team, but we have some really exciting stuff going on with our underserved and vulnerable communities program, UVC, at the Detroit office. Um, so we've done a pretty extensive analysis of our CWA and kind of some of the more underrepresented groups that are in this area, some of the more vulnerable communities. And it just so happens that a lot of our vulnerable communities are in urban areas, which tend to be very prone to flooding. Um, we've had quite a few flooding instances in the last several years that have really impacted these folks in the Detroit area. Um, so we are really focused on, you know, adapting our service model to kind of help these underserved and vulnerable communities. Uh, and Steve Considine, he's kind of the lead for this program. Um, he wasn't able to make it today, but I'm going to do my best to highlight some of our initiatives. So the first is uh, we've met with the Eastside Community Network Partnership um, in December, I believe. And this, this was an effort um, to kind of connect with folks in the community. It's a nonprofit that serves uh, the predominantly African-American communities on the east side of Detroit. So we went down there, um, we did a talk about winter weather safety, and we met with residents and kind of got their input on how they use their services, if they use them at all, and kind of, you know, heard their stories about what the flooding was like for them um, and some of the other weather events that have gone on in the city of Detroit. We also installed a co-op site there, so we have better kind of rain estimations of um, what's going on when we have those flooding events. And we plan to keep this um, connection going through the future. So we're gonna conduct spring skyward talks and other weather workshops at this facility. So we have a pretty good um, open line of communication with them. And if you do have any questions about this program, I have Steve's information on here. So he'll be happy to you know, reach out and, and chat with you guys. And my last slide here is just another one of our efforts, uh, the Manistique Community Treehouse Center partnership. So I mentioned, you know, flooding is a, a big issue in Detroit. So this is a nonprofit that serves a very flood prone neighborhood in Detroit. And again, um, one of the best ways that we've been able to kind of contact the community is just, you know, go visit with them and chat with them about um, some of the, the issues that they've had or um, different vulnerabilities. So we'll be doing a Skywarn presentation there in the spring, as well as we're planning kind of a field trip for our uh, forecasters and other staff to kind of visit this area and meet with residents and um, just visit the community. So with that, um, I guess if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free. Otherwise, uh, you can contact me or Steve via email and we'd be happy to kind of share some of this stuff with you guys. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Megan. That was fantastic. I agree. Agree. 
Uh, the, I love the blog posts and sharing with the other offices. I, you know, I think that's that's awesome. You know, we think a lot about the the whole office concept, but you you, you all are taking it to the the whole neighborhood or whole region concept concept and and sharing with one another. So I think that's great work. And the Google Sites page to keep up everyone up to date is awesome too. And then lastly, I, I love the connections that you're making with with your communities there. You know, reaching out to to build relationships and and have that trust. Uh, it's just key to everything that we do. So once again, just phenomenal work. And uh, thanks for, for taking the time and uh, creating slides and sharing sharing that with all of us here today. Though. So really, really appreciate it. Thank um, you. Yeah, the slides I shared, so anybody can access them. I'll share them with you uh, after awesome. the meeting. Yep, yep. And, and uh, the, the slides that you do share will be on our culture team website, and I'll make sure to share that with everybody as well too. So awesome. Um. I don't, did anybody have any questions real quick before I move on to Taylor? And as she had mentioned, feel free to, to reach out to her. Um, just great work, yep. Okay, on that note, uh, Taylor, if you are ready, feel free to, to share your slides there. We can see your slides there, Taylor. Awesome, thanks. Yep. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Taylor Patterson, as Stephen said, and I am a forecaster and the team culture lead here at the Milwaukee Sullivan office. And today I'm just gonna kind of go over some of our best practices at the office and then how that led to us picking our two focus areas and then the questions that our office has to ask ourselves on the road ahead. So I just wanted to start with like MKX culture kind of over the years, we've had a big generational shift from our 2016 OHI survey to our most recent one. We were in office for that first survey where we had an average age range right around 50. And then we lost eight to seven people right around 2018. And then we have surged back up to a mostly full staff at this point with an average age around 20. And so that has had a big impact on our culture throughout the years. And it's a good gauge on what has changed for us um, outside of just looking at us performing well on those OHI surveys. And I think a lot of that has to do with the continued enthusiasm that a lot of our staff has. A lot of our staff comes in every day regardless of whatever task they're doing, whether it's a project, the forecast, or working on IDSS stuff. There is a enthusiasm that in permeates the office and it affects everyone here when they come into work. And then a lot of that too is regular employee input. No matter what team you're on, whether it is a IDSS team, culture, marine, there's always a lot of emails and talking back and forth to people outside the team on how did this year go? How could we do better? And there's a lot of reflection that happens within our own office. And a lot of that has to do with some of our established practices here that we have at Milwaukee. We spend a lot of our time trying to embrace the Kenton's vision with a lot of IDSS. Um, over the last two to three years, we have averaged um, 80 plus on-site DSS shifts where our forecasters are off on the weekends or weekdays engaging with our partners. And a lot of that too has gotten us into probabilistic messaging with some of the regional and national testing that has been going on. And it has allowed us to talk to our partners and really get a sense of what they gain from our forecasts. And all of this is possible based on our schedule. Um, we have a lot of cross utilization where just like today, we walk in all of our day shift forecasters kind of talk to each other and say, hey, what do you have to do today? Would you like to do the forecast, DSS, do you have a project to work on? And we kind of split everything from there. So everyone works every single shift. And of course, that's created a lot of camaraderie and respect. And um, we also have two hour fl shift flexes. So if you're scheduled eight to four, you could start as early as six or you could start as early as 10 or as late as 10. 
And so with that flexibility, um, it has allowed us to have more of a work-life balance and it has allowed our coworkers to be more invested in each other and more in invested in what we do outside of the office and talk more about our activities and our families with each other. And so that has allowed our culture team to really branch out and do a lot of different things with our office. Um, as far as community outreach, we spend a lot of time doing Adopt a Highway. We go out three to four times a year and we pick up trash on the side of a highway near our office and we get a lot of involvement from our staff with that every year. And then during the winter months, we do a lot of Jefferson County Christmas Neighbors where we raise a lot of funds for families and then get gifts for them and deliver them to those families. But it also goes to peer-to-peer um, -peer appreciation with our weather rock of appreciation that is given to people throughout the non-bargaining unit and um, information sharing with our lunch break sessions. So that's for anyone who wants to spend 15, 30 minutes presenting something to our staff, whether that's a leadership book that they read, um, any diversity information they'd like to bring, a project they're working on. And so it's a way for us to expand and look at what projects our coworkers are working on. And of course, we do a lot of group outings like a lot of other offices. We'll have Mario Kart nights, which are very impromptu. And now that we've had people that have come to our office and left, it is slowly starting to expand that network to, to impromptu Mario Kart nights with other offices. And so with all this, with all of the moving parts that we have here at Milwaukee, um, the culture team wanted to send out a survey to their staff when it came to our blueprint structure. We were concerned that there could be some new employees who are less willing to speak up or people who weren't um, looking to rock the boat with having to say anything negative. So our big thing was making this a confidential survey um, to determine our two focus areas. So we used a lot of the Office of Organizational Excellence and OHI questions and we formate formatted our own short little survey um, with four questions for each topic area from every focus area. And then we added in a few extra questions as well, um, one of which you'll see reflected on the right. So we asked our office to describe three things that they thought of when they think of our object office, three adjectives. And so um, we created a word cloud then from that and presented it to the rest of our office on these are the things that people think about when they come to our office, when they're working in our office. And so going through all the results, it essentially left us to look at transparency and openness and knowledge sharing and collaboration. We have a lot of working parts here, a lot of people on the road, um, sometimes two or three people on the road for IDSS on a, any given weekend. And that requires a lot of knowledge sharing from older coworkers to newer coworkers and um, from new employees from the private sector sharing ideas. So we wanted to get back to some of the basics of communication there. And so then now on the road ahead, with the shift in age range with the shift of a lot of new employees coming in. Um, we really do as a culture team want to focus on making sure everyone gets a chance to know each other better, making sure that we know what their preferred way of communicating is. If there's a better way we could be communicating, if there's ways we could do things differently. And especially with those two hour shift flexes, um, sometimes the person doing the main part of the forecasting leaves before the next person arrives. And so you're left with just one person there and it's how do you play that game of telephone to make sure that all the important information is passed along between these three people. And so we want to get more organized communication between morning meetings, between shift collaboration changes. And so then this leads our culture team to now facilitate questions of, are we leveraging the individual talents of our office? Are the people who come into our office from the private sector being able to share as much information as they would like to? Um, do the people who like to public speak getting the opportunity to do that? Are we giving the people the opportunity to do more research projects or do more computer programming if that's their passion? And are we doing this efficiently? Is there a different way we could be doing it? Which allows us to then talk to other offices about how they're doing things to see if there's a different approach we could be taking. And then, as always, maximizing the work-life balance. 
Um, right now with the two hour shift flexes for most shifts, it's been working out pretty well, but could there be something else we're missing? So these are big questions our culture team is gonna have to um, navigate moving forward and talk with the rest of our staff about. But that's all that I have as far as Milwaukee culture. Um, thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to pass them along to me. Yeah. I saw someone raise their hand. I see clapping. I do not see a hand right right now. Oh, Amanda. Oh, there we go. Yep. I did that earlier. Yep. <laughs> All right, we're having fun. Stina. Yeah, Taylor, that was great. Uh, you know, I love the communication, the office sharing, the regular input, you know, where everyone feels uh, they are truly part of the office and team. I, I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, if anybody knows me, I'm a big fan of shift flexibility, and I love the flexibility uh, you have with how you approach operations, and not just with the times, but also just, you know, getting on shift and, and seeking ways to ensure that not just operations, which obviously is, is first, but everything outside of operations, which is also first, <laughs> there's a balance there, you know, that, that's getting done because, you know, uh, you know, mission first, obviously, but people first. And when the mission is not critical, the mission are our people. And it sounds like you, you all are doing that, which is, which is absolutely fantastic there. Um, Mario Kart night, which was really cool to hear. And I, you know, while you were chatting there, I, I threw some uh, some links um, in the chat there on, on the side there. But uh, uh, a great way to take advantage of the benefits of active rest, which I think is phenomenal there. So uh, awesome. Kudos to you and your staff management there. I uh, loved hearing this. This is awesome work. Thank you so much for sharing. I don't know if anybody and you had a, a quick question or two before we move on. Um, from here. And if not, uh, as always, I'm assuming Taylor would welcome an email. You can email me as well, too. We'd be more than happy to help out. Thanks again, Taylor. Thanks again, Megan, too. Also, I appreciate your assistance here this morning. Awesome job. All right, again, I'll read the break. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Megan. I really appreciate that. When you share, you allow other people to grow and learn, and that is huge. Um, I'm very happy to, to hear what's happening in both offices. Uh, I will single out right now, Detroit has done some huge success in establishing, I think the first co-op station ever in urban Detroit in the past year. Um, that's, that's a huge cultural shift. That is a huge partnership with the community. So uh, again, my hat off to them, and again also to uh, Milwaukee, Robert Sermonetti. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mindy Barons, who is uh, leading up the Leaf for Everyone work group today. Mindy. All right. Thank you. Hang on. Let me get my slideshow up here from the beginning. Ah. Ah, oh, no, I messed everything up. Hang on. Press the wrong button. There we go. Yes. So, uh, Welcome everyone and, and glad to be here um, presenting from the Lead for Everyone work group. Um, talking about today our monthly discussion topic. So um, we'll be looking February is Influence Month. Um, and, and again, resources um, that we have for the Lead for Everyone work group and, and looking forward to, to different things coming from that. So I'll be speaking today and then I do have a, a guest um, sharing some experiences later. So I'll bring him in at that time. Um, so again, just looking for those resources, anybody looking for leadership resources from our group, Lead for Everyone um, Google site page on Central Region has a different range of topics there. You can see all of our monthly discussion topics, um, intended use by offices for individual development or professional growth, um, just any way that it can help out um, the, the people here of the National Weather Service and Central Region. Uh, going into the topic for the month, really looking at the connection between leadership and influence. Um, and, and to look at that, I wanna dive back into some of the definitions of what leadership can be. 
Um, so leadership, a couple definitions I found, you know, the creation of positive change through meticulous planning, vision, and strategy. So, you know, that's leading the people through these changes. But the big part of this definition of leadership is also the practice of positive influence. So a lot of people, you know, correlating leadership with influence and showing that strong connection, which is why I find this topic to be, you know, such an important one um, as a leadership topic. So looking again at some other uh, explanations of the way people have defined leadership, Dwight Eisenhower defined it as the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because they want to do it. So again, that's really showing that influence connection. Um, we really want to be, you know, the leader who inspires those around us and, and that kind of gets them into, you know, performing at a high level uh, because they want to and because, you know, they're, they're inspired and encouraged to do so. And really that means that we want to rely more on a positional authority or the title of a leader, but to convince those um, to follow us, again, not because they have to, but because they want to, because they see that vision and that vision matches, um, you know, where they wanna go and, and, and a part of what they want to be. So again, looking now into influence, really it's, it's building um, you know, a couple different definitions of what it can be and how it ta tailors off um, the, the leadership connection. So the capacity to have an effect on the character development or the behavior of someone or something, um, or the ability to again, affect that behavior of others in a particular direction. So it's kind of guiding people along and influencing them into certain behaviors or directions. Um, and then a force, of one person, the agent, is exerting on someone else the target to include a change in that target. Force is a little bit of a, a, a strong word. Um, I kind of would like to see that more as just like being intentional with how you're leading people to try to, you know, get them to induce that change. So that could be changes in a behavior or an opinion, um, looking at an attitude, but, you know, moving people towards a goal. Um, getting people um, needs met in certain ways in different ways and bringing people together um, and, and, you know, looking at their values as well. So with those three ones of influence, another way to really look at it, and I thought this summed it up nicely, is a person who causes you to react controls you. So then that's, again, you know, using kind of that position of authority to command somebody to do something. But a person who compels you to think and consider doing differently influences you. So that's really what we're looking at, trying to, you know, gather people together to be moving in that same direction because they all want to be moving in that direction. So again, you want to, you know, inspire that team. We don't want to command that authority because, you know, being a leader doesn't necessarily mean that it's related to our position or our title. Um, or a certain role you have. You can really, you know, you're a leader in everything that you do and everywhere you can be. You know, the newest employee out there on the operations floor can be a leader in, you know, the attitude they have that day and the way people kind of congregate around them or, or can see what their vision or explanation is for, for certain things. Or, you know, you're having operations discussion and kind of getting together to kind of where things are gonna go for the forecast that day or, or a messaging opportunity. Um, you know, it's these little ways that we can all be leaders every day um, in our personal lives and at, at work, um, that it's not always, you know, the, the big leader that you see, you know, marching the, the troops out in battle. It's, it's a lot of times just small conversations we're having with everyone. And, and um, just, you know, highlighting it's not really a restriction to people that have better personality traits. You know, some people have a way to really, um, you know, express a vision and they're very charismatic. And while that helps people, you know, maybe provide influence and, and be a leader, it doesn't necessarily make them a leader and, and make somebody else who doesn't have some of those things not be a leader. So just trying to um, explain some of that as we move into the influence um, portion of, of leadership. So again, with, with influencing being such a strong part of leadership, some skills for every role, um, that is a part of influencing are the same as 
core leadership skills. So, you know, looking at communicating, be able to communicate a shared vision, a goal um, in the act of influencing. Also that person having um, agility and learning. So you want to be able to be open to new things, be open to different ideas, be thinking about people's different perspectives and learning about them and always learning and looking for for ways to you know broaden one's view and 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 see others' perspectives. Um, a big part of leadership and even in working into influence is self-awareness. So we want to you know understand where we have a bias or where um, a blind spot or a weakness, but also know our strengths. So putting all those together to be able to um, influence others and and be an effective leader, um, because without that influence, uh, leadership you know, can, has struggles and, and doesn't occur. So, you know, again, a lot of people, leadership is the act of actually influencing those outcomes and, and wanting to inspire and persuade and encourage people um, as we move through the tactics of, of leadership or leadership and influence. The first big step of, of influence and, and kind of being the, the leader and, and putting influence into action, is being authentic. So, you know, you want to know yourself and you want to be grounded in who you are and, and you need to be comfortable enough with your team to show them your true self. So you really want to, you know, know yourself and be yourself because it conveys honesty and transparency and openness and specifically consistency. If you're not acting different in different situations or putting on a show or being something who you aren't, you know, you're not going to be consistent and then people aren't going to actually know who you are because they don't know which person they're going to get every time they talk to you. So you really want to be yourself in all situations and show people who you are and demonstrate to your team members and, and people around you, you know, who you are and they, they get to know you and it can provide a positive experience and, and keep that engagement with your team members. So how do we go about building that authentic influence? How do we think about if we have a vision and a goal that we want to move people towards? Um, the first thing is really, um, again, building that authentic, inclusive, positive, um, mutually beneficial environment. So building trust, building rapport among the team members, above the people you're working with, above the community. So, you know, this is just kind of good, personal connections um, with with everybody in the office and, and any part of a team, but especially the leader. So you want to spend time getting to know your team, strengthening those interpersonal connections, realizing you know why people make decisions they do, how they make decisions, who's learning better, who's you know which which way can you connect with people to to see the people you're working with and and know them and they know you. So the other way is also to be an active listener. You know, people really want to be led by people they like. Um, and part of that is listening to people. Um, being liked to, as a leader and as a manager is to be concerned and engaged and empathetic to your team's needs. You're, you're listening to them, you're understanding them, you're getting to know them. And that way you can really, um, you know, help meet their needs or provide that vision or that, um, that adjustment in that, you know, act of influence that is going to key in to connect with that person. You also need to show commitment to your team because if you're not committed to them as people, you know, why would they maybe want to follow you or go along with that vision? Um, they'll just see you as, you know, maybe using them as different cogs in a wheel or taking steps to whatever. So you want to show that you're committed to the people that you're working with and finding ways to show others that you're committed to them on a group and individual level. And again, that all just goes back to getting to know your team. You find out, you know, what each individual's strengths are. You find out what each individual's aspirations and growths um, personal development, things that, you know, their values and and who they are as a person. Um, but then also as a group, who are we together? How are we working together? How can we work together to meet, you know, the mission of the National Weather Service? And show the commitment that you're finding, you know, ways to, to get them, um, 
the resources they need, the the job, you know, the opportunities of personal growth that they need, the projects they're interested in, all that kind of things is, is showing that commitment to your team. And lastly, one of the other skills is to really be focused and set an example. You know, walking the walk is 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 what we need to do. Set an example of accountability in yourself, showing appreciation of others. Um, can set that example of how you expect the team members to interact and how you expect you know the vision of success of how the team members can be successful um and you can you know again connect with the team to find out how they like to be recognized or praised they can make a big difference in others motivations on um, seeing that consistent approach from the leader seeing the accountability and um and seeing the example um, being set so looking at how we influence others again to influence a leader or any person looking to you know work through that group can use specific intentional strategies or tactics their actual behaviors designed to change another person's attitudes beliefs or values um, it's been found that um, there's kind of three categories of these different tactics but that can be you know influencing different people things or events and the strength and effectiveness of that influence can vary depending on that situation and the type of influence um, that you that you use in those situations so again we're looking at a goal to influence others getting them to act or change differently um, because they want to not manipulate them into changing or acting the way you want to and again there's different approaches for different situations and sometimes more than one approach can be used in the same situation so it's really trying to think about how you want to influence people and what is the goal, what is the vision, how do you want to move forward and appealing to those tactics of the head, heart, or hands. So some of those three tactics are looking at logical, emotional, or cooperative appeals. So in other words, appealing to the head, the heart, or the hands of your team members. For example, so the illogical appeals, you might tap into people's rational and intellectual positions. So um, maybe you have um, using rational persuasion techniques when there's factual evidence to present because you're presenting an argument for the best choice of action based on maybe the organizational benefits or the personal benefits and appealing to people's mind. Um, but then, you know, maybe you really want to connect your message to a goal or project to the individual's goals and values. So then you're really looking for that emotional appeal to the heart. So you're looking at an idea that may promote the personal feelings of well-being or service or sense of belonging to get a good chance of gaining support. And then that a cooperative appeals or the hands is just looking to see how people can be involved in that change. So maybe they're helping um, come up with the ways that you move towards that direction. So they're collaborating on a solution or you get consultation and ideas from them built into how you're gonna go about the change or you know building different alliances. So you're working together to accomplish that goal um, and, and, and the hands that they get to have a hand in the change. So really leaders who effectively use these tactics to influence people and really putting them together and, and working them um, like i said more than one may work towards a situation can achieve the goals and objectives more successfully than leaders who lack the ability to kind of move in these three areas um, regardless of where you sit in the organization so again it, it you know regardless of what role or or title you have really trying to connect with everyone and um use these intentionally and strategically to to work towards the goals the vision the the progress you're trying to make is is kind of the the main key to influence so right now i have um uh experiences so this kind of some shared experience of influence from uh dave beachler the science and operations officer in wfo indianapolis so i'd like to welcome him into um speaking today and sharing with you. All right, cool. Great. Thanks, Mindy. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad we're still seeing a lot of people on this call. Um, and when Mindy asked me about this, I was thinking, gosh, what have I been influenced by or, or what are the things I do to influence others uh, from a leadership perspective? 
And I could probably talk for an hour about the, the vast things that have been influenced on me and the, the things that I try to influence on others. Um, but I, I broke it down into three different things and, and I'll touch on, on those things and highlight that and how it relates to the stuff that Mindy was sharing. Uh, and for me, actually, it goes back to before I became a weather service employee. And actually I was a student at Purdue University and I was involved with the football program and I was an equipment manager. And it just so happened that the four years that I was there was when uh, Drew Brees was our quarterback and Joe Tiller was the head coach. And I got to work with some incredible people, incredible leaders uh, that influenced uh, others from a coaching perspective. And I learned a lot of those things about how to connect with players, how to connect with people, how to message things in the right way, how to think about what I'm going to do uh, before I actually do that. And all of those things really kind of set the, the wheels in motion for me uh, with what I do today. So fast forward, getting into the weather service, and I had some incredible people that uh, kind of guided me along the way. I had no idea that I wanted to be a science officer, uh, but there was one person that, that kind of started that, that ball, and that was Randy Graham. Uh, Randy took time when he was the science officer in Grand Rapids with me as a forecaster to kind of guide me along and, and figure out different things that, that I saw that, that maybe I could potentially do down the road. And, and then that led to another influence of being, being a forecaster in State College with Rich Grum and having some, some incredible giants in the Sioux community that really influenced me and what they had done uh, and sharing some things that I could then take with me when I go to the next place. And so, all of those things kind of kind of culminated into me finding my myself in the suit position here and i started thinking about like what can i do because it's not about me anymore it's about what can i do to pay forward what has been given to me uh, from prior science officers and, and other employees that i was around what can i do to pay it back to them and also the next generation of forecasters so I try to have office hours with my staff. I, I meet with them on a somewhat routine basis and we just have conversations. And it's about connecting with them and, and seeing what can I do to help them. And I think that really is the key there is, is that if you connect with your employees that, that way, you really can go and move mountains and do some really tremendous things. And, and that's really the key to all of this when, when you're trying to influence others. Uh, but that all relates to everything and, and the goal of what we're trying to do with, with people first and making sure that we uh, achieve all of those successes that we have ahead of us. Uh, and we also have some challenges, but as a leader and, and trying to influence others, you have to continuously do those things. And so those are the, some of the things that I try to do in, in my role uh, with where I'm at today. So thank you, Mindy. I appreciate the time. Yes, thank you for sharing. I appreciate you you um, helping out. So a uh, final couple slides here. Um, moving ahead, just kind of some um, ways that we could practice and put this into practice or put this into motion. So again, we're really trying to understand, you know, as a leader and looking to influence in a different situation that may be coming up, why um, you know we we are doing what we're doing and, and why are we moving towards this goal or wanting the team move towards a goal so that we can be clear about you know our own values and goals and point of view when we're trying to apply these influence skills into a situation. That way, again, that influencing comes from a place of authenticity and can have that greatest impact and 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 create that connection. So as an activity, think about um, as we go you know, forward uh, would be to um, think about a situation in the near future when you might need to influence someone. And here's some questions that we could ask ourselves to, re to reflect um, on kind of forming a plan as we as we kind of move through. So, you know, like who exactly am I attempting to influence as we move into the situation? Um, what is the situation and, and what kind of support, what kind of support of the idea um, are we looking for? And, you know, which tactic or combination of tactics 
um, might be best um, to, to move forward and establishing that trust and rapport. You know, usually in a situation like this, it might be something where we've already been working on um, those connections and, and with the, the people we're working with. So, um, but if it is newer people or a new team that you're working on, trying to, you know, establish that, that trust and support and getting to know people. Um, and then, you know, what kind of responses would I maybe anticipate so that I can use these tactics to maybe address those concerns? And what mutual points of agreement um, would we maybe be able to come about? Now, you know, things can always be a little bit different when you get into the heat of the actual discussions or the talks, but, you know, just trying to come up with a few things that you might need to address um, is, is something at least uh, giving you a practice and, and giving you an idea. And then, you know, depending on how that situation moves forward, how could I end on a positive note in a way that I can still, um, you know, leave the table open uh, to, to continued discussions or continued work and progress towards that goal. And then lastly, a self-reflection exercise of, um, you know, it's one thing we're talking about how uh, to be an influencer and to to build that influence and, and actually influence others, but also recognize when you're in a situation um, when you are being influenced. So um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's it's hard to recognize those situations, but that self-awareness, again, of those biases and your personal point of view, you might realize, you know, will play into that situation, um, determining, you know, knowing, again, your current strengths or your development needs for that situation can help you kind of respond to that that situation in which you may be influenced and, and then be able to work together with that person um, in, in the vision and the goal that they are trying um, to move everybody towards. And then understand that you'll typically act out of your strengths. So kind of, you know, see where where that may take you and what typical approach may be better at. And a big thing is, you know, you can always know those goals and your values and be able to put that into practice back when you're talking with the people to maybe, again, um, come towards a, a common understanding of how you're going to move towards that goal or that shared vision. So that is all I have. And then I have some reference articles um, that all were very helpful in putting together this presentation, but also would be um, great resources for anybody wanting to learn more about influence and, and put some of these things into practice. So I'm going to stop sharing because I lost my screen and it sounds like there's maybe a question and then I can come back to it. So hang on. All right, so now I am back if there were any questions and I'll be sure to um, share these slides um, with the people that they need to put them somewhere, but we'll also have them on our um, on our uh, lead for everyone page as well. So. All right, Mindy, anything else today? Uh, I don't think so. Just thank you for having me today. So All right, anybody can right. feel free to email me too as part of the work group so all right i want to thank you the lead for everyone work group for putting material together again uh take the same material that's there and making it something we can use day to day uh, like today's presentation might be the cornerstone of a discussion that you could have in your office to bring this through to to everyone to allow people to grow so take advantage of the resources that they've created and again thank you very much to everyone today, I say thank you and thank you to the attendees for being here. And I uh, look forward to seeing many of you, if not all of you, next month and more. Uh, take care.